Namaste. You know, a couple of the commenters on the channel recently have highlighted an issue that, I mean, I covered years ago uh, quite extensively, and that is the preparation or the qualifications for the Advaita sadhana, uh, attainment of Turiya, right? Um, you don't just walk in off the street and do it, you know, in a weekend or a week or a year. Uh, certain prerequisites have to be met. I mean, that's why the Advaita was only taught, you know, in the forest to very qualified people. But now the cat is out of the bag. Everybody has access to the scriptures. So somebody has to, like, put it into perspective, put it into context. And that person has to be experienced, has to be realized, because that's what it's all about, you know? So until one meets certain prerequisites, everything we're talking about here, about Vedanta and Advaita and Brahma Sutras and Upanishads and all of that is simply theory. It's just words, and words are not realization. doesn't matter how much you know, you know. <laughs> it's the being, the level of consciousness, the development of consciousness, the purification of consciousness that actually brings the, the view, you know, the experience of Brahman, of being Brahman. Huh? Like Ramana Maharshi said, you cannot see Brahman, you can only be Brahman. So being Brahman means being the witness, being the observer, not being a participant, not being an actor, not being an agent, not being a cause of anything, huh? but uh, simply going with the flow, so to speak. Now, somebody is going to say, well, what about you? You know, you're putting all this effort into making these videos and preaching and teaching up a storm. And yeah, I admit it. Man, I got Mars exalted uh, 21 degrees in Capricorn, or Sagittarius, or whatever it is. I got to do something with that energy. So, you know, either it comes out like this as good advice or... You know, it would come out in some kind of uh, obsessive enjoyment or something like that. And that would only cause me trouble. So I'll tell you the secret. How I live a peaceful, happy life. Chanting. Chanting. Well, I've been chanting mantras since I was, I don't know, 22, 24 years old. That's over 60 years now. So, <laughs> you know, mantras. Mantras, how can I tell you? How can I overestimate the value of chanting mantras? I can't. There's no way. I, I can't hype it enough. Why is that? Well, chanting mantras, any mantras, doesn't matter really what it is. The intention behind is what matters. And when the intention is right, in other words, I am chanting this mantra to attain final emancipation and complete enlightenment. If you have that intention, you can chant any mantra, whatever. It doesn't matter. It doesn't make any difference. You will get the result. In terms of the quality of your intention. So it's not about mechanically chanting the mantra, Om Namah Shivaya, Om Namah Shivaya, Om Namah Shivaya. You know, although that is a place to start for real beginners. You know, I'm not going to deny it. In the beginning, my chanting was very mechanical because, you know, that's all I knew. 
I had been to music school and they taught me to be a perfect performance machine, a robot reading music off the page. Then I discovered jazz and drugs right about the same time. <laughs> Never looked back. So that which affords you the greatest creative agency is going to be the most attractive thing for you. And so I want to uh, describe how in the advanced stages of bhakti, spontaneous bhakti, this chanting develops into a whole inner world. I am not joking. And it's your inner world. It is you exercising your prerogative as Brahman, the self, to build a mental environment that perfectly counteracts your bad karma. To put it as simple as I can. In psychology, this is called compensation. It's part of adjustment, overall adjustment, right? But spiritually speaking, or what it looks like from the driver's seat, you know, <laughs> is that one is dreaming, or, well, thinking, huh, while chanting. And what happens is you go into kind of an alpha state. You go into a dream state, a trance state. And in this trance, you dream of your ideal scene, your ideal world, your ideal relationships, your ideal activities, your body, your form, your actions, everything. So, of course, this is the most attractive thing because this is your self acting on its prerogative as Brahman to create the world you want to live in, in the next life. Now, it's almost a given that that will not be in a physical body. Because anyone who exercises their imagination <laughs> in terms of a relationship with God, Ishwar, huh? I mean, the main boss, right? That could go any place. That relationship could develop along any number of, of multiple axes that are called rasa, the juice, you know, the tasty juice. And so the rasa is of five principal kinds, neutrality, servitude, parenthood, friendship, and conjugal love. Guess which one I'm into. <laughs> well, actually, I'm into all of them. All of the main rasas and all of the subsidiary rasas with different aspects of relationship with multiple forms of God. You can believe that or you can disbelieve that. I don't care. It doesn't make any difference to me. But in my meditations, I go into these uh, imaginary worlds, you know, but what looks like imaginary in this life becomes real in the next life if this yoga is continued up to the moment of death. Because as Krishna says in Bhagavad Gita, whatever you're thinking about at the time you leave your body, whatever state of being, uh, you imagine that is where and how you're born in the next life. And there will be a next life because the jiva is eternal for the duration of the universe. Get used to the idea, right? Unless you can realize Nirguna Brahman and just disappear, you know, you're going to have another body, but it's probably not going to be a material body. Because as I said, if you engage your imagination on the concept of, I can have any kind of relationship I want with the all-powerful God, huh? 
or as the all-powerful God with myself, actually, I can do anything. I can have anything, right? And it is absolutely not harmful to anybody else because it takes place completely in my own subjective consciousness, not in any shared world. I mean, unless there are some other beings who have uh, similar tastes and want to share their worlds, you know, everything is possible, right? But I'm talking about the foundation, which is realization of your own ultimate state of individuality in eternity in terms of the duration of the universe, which is the subtle body. Mind, intelligence, false ego, uh, the antakarana, the inner organ, which includes Ananda Moya Kosha, the bliss sheath, the final covering or upadi of Brahman. In this bliss sheath, one can experience pastimes of almost unimaginable satisfaction. And these can go on, you know, unlimitedly, as much as, you know, your current bodily situation will support. At some point, you have to get some rest, right? <laughs> and do other things, you know, like cook and clean and make videos. <laughs> That's pretty much my lifestyle. I take care of myself, I exercise, cook and clean, which is like, you know, chop wood and carry water and take care of business, you know, and uh, in whatever time is left, I chant, read, or more like study and prepare these videos. So uh, this is the result of a lifetime of sadhana, a lifetime of chanting. I mean, when I chant Panchakshara Mantra, Aung Namah Shivaya, it's almost like nourishment. It's, it's almost, you know, it gives me energy of a certain kind that I can't get anywhere else, including relationships with other human beings, unfortunately. Uh, because the love of God and God's love for us is unconditional, unlimited, pure, and of any flavor, you know, whatever flavor it takes to satisfy both parties, which, you know, it, with him is anything. He's up for anything. It's stated in the scripture that Shiva is pleased even by those who hate him. Because hate is a powerful motivator for devotion. What is devotion? Well, in this context, it's merely staying in relationship for an extended period of time and investing a lot of energy in that relationship. Look at all the great demons and villains of all time. Ravana, Hiranyakashipu, huh? um, who is that? Duryodhan. Uh, Duryodhan was always thinking of Krishna, but he was thinking of him as an enemy because he was too friendly with Arjuna. He couldn't trust him. <laughs> but because of that, he died. He left his body in the presence of Krishna. So he got liberation. I mean, even Dhritarashtra got liberation because he kept company with Vidura until the very end. And Vidura was already realized. So, see, these are the things that people don't realize. And so they tend to be impatient and jump from one teaching or one teacher to another, looking for that shot, you know, that's going to do it for them. But I'm telling you, the real shot is when you chant your mantra, any mantra, and do other devotional activities for a long span of time. How the result comes is simply through grace. But it does come. 
Aum Tat Sat, Aum Shakti Aum, Aum Namah Shivaya.